Hi folks, how are you doing? I'm a Reverend Danny Crosby, Unitarian Minister serving congregations in Altrincham and Ermston in the northwest of England. I do hope you're finding the love and witnessing some blessings in life, even in these terribly difficult times. It is hard, my friends, but we're all in this together. So I'm offering these little devotions just as a little bit of hope, playing my role in being a been a part of the solution, I suppose. I offer these devotions as a balm for the heart, the mind, the spirit and the soul. The title for today's reflection is Hell is a place where nothing connects. So I invite us just to still ourselves together. Let's invite a loving presence to be here amongst us and to awaken from deep deep within us. I have lit the flame of freedom, freedom lit, in this cup of love, belonging and acceptance. Come as you are. We join together despite our physical separation, united in our devotion to life and to love. Help us to sing the song for joy, like the birds do each morning as they sing that their song of faith, their faith in being alive and being here. They sing their love for life. They sing the joy of living. May we know the deep connections that sustain us, the roots that hold and nurture us beneath the surface of our lives. May we remember that we are deeply connected in heart, mind, spirit and in soul, despite our physical disconnection at this time. May we be open to growth this day. May we be open to life this day. Open to one another this day. Open to love this day. Open to what might yet be. May we be open. Amen. I'm going to begin this devotion with a, a wonderful piece that's titled Remembrance, and it comes from The Changing Nature of Man by J. H. Van den Berg. What a great name. He writes. In a chapter of his diary published in 1953, Jean Cocteau described what happened to him when he was walking down the street on which a large part of his youth had been spent. We had been in the neighbourhood before, but a, vague, but a vague diffidence known to us all had restrained him from going further and looking at his old house. But this time he did enter the porch of the house and in a few moments he was in the backyard he saw that the trees had grown higher and he was trying to identify other changes when a suspicious voice asked him the reason for his presence. His honest answer could not convince the man and after a few minutes he found himself back in the street. Cocteau, who did not want to lose the charm of his past too soon, recalled the way he used to walk through the streets and on the pavement. He remembered that he used to walk close to the houses, trailing his finger along the wall. Who did not do that when he was a child? The gates were a special attraction. Hand and finger would leap from one spike to the next. The porches involved the delightful necessity of climbing the steps. The finger then traced the panel on the door. One was almost assimilated by the unknown behind it, of which sometimes the smell reached us. No porch, no door, no gate was neglected. He would have not have dared to forget even one of them, convinced as he were that the silent reproach or the dumb complaint of the one we forgot to touch with our finger would come down on us. The obligation made us bold. Sometimes the porches were very deep and they have never been so deeper again. Very occasionally, we even had to force ourselves bravely 
into long dark passages which implied unexpected and in our eyes dangerous incidents but we had to the door at the end of the walk was relentless a child feels compassion for forgotten things if he is to feel every tree along the road then it is impossible for him to leave the lone tree far to the side devoid of his benevolent touch we lose this compassion we no longer believe in the aliveness of things and consequently we are deaf to their entreaties the habit of tracing the unevenness of the walls with one's finger gets lost we don't do it anymore we no longer believe in the aliveness of things but Cocteau did thinking of the past he trailed his hand along the wall but he was not satisfied with the result he felt something was missing suddenly it became clear to him what was wrong he had been smaller as a child his hand had touched surfaces which he missed as an adult simply because he was drawing a different line. He decided to repeat the experiment, but this time he bent down. In Paris, one can do such a thing. He bent down, closed his eyes and let his hand trace the wall at a height which had been natural in the days he went to school and immediately appeared what he had vaguely been expecting. Just as the needle picks up the melody from the record, I obtained the melody of the past with my hand. I found everything, my cape, the lever of my satchel, the names of my friends and of my teachers, certain expressions I had used, the sound of my grandfather's voice, the smell of his beard, the smell of my sister's dresses and of my mother's gown. So a reminiscence there from the childhood of Jean Cocteau as he traced back. And that lovely, lovely line. We no longer believe in the aliveness of things. The Cocteau did. We no longer believe in the aliveness of things. Mm. There is no greater ache than the loneliness of no longer being touched by life. It's aliveness. This is hell. Hell is a place where nothing connects. Therefore, surely heaven must be a place where everything connects. It was T.S. Eliot who claimed that hell is a place where nothing connects and that hell is oneself. Jean-Paul Sartre replied to this by saying, no, hell is other people. The truth is that to some extent they are both correct. Hell, at least on earth, can often be oneself and it can be other people too. Eliot believed that it was self-absorption and self-protection that caused people to feel separate and alone. So many of us have highly developed self-awareness, and yet we can still feel completely cut off from life. Are we too self-absorbed? Do we suffer because we live an over-examined life, and yet an under-connected life too? Have we become lost in ourselves? Do we suffer from living the over-examined life and yet the under-connected life? I think there's truth in this, although it's not the whole truth. Perhaps some people feel cut off and alone because they are too focused on the faults of others. How often do we hear folk blaming others for all of their troubles? This builds barriers, it creates loneliness and it cuts people off from one another. Yes, hell can be ourselves and it can be other people too. For many years of my life, I felt disconnected, cut off, lost and lonely. I felt like I was living in hell. I saw hell as myself and I saw it as other people too. From a young age, I learned to protect myself from pain. Of course, I failed utterly in my attempts to do so. All I succeeded in achieving eventually was to cut myself off from any joy. And due to this, I experienced a deeper, more ingrained suffering what I have heard described as the worst suffering, the suffering within the suffering. 
I have learned that heaven and hell, at least here on earth, and that's the only place we know about, are two sides of the same coin. They possess similar characteristics, but there is one important difference, how we experience them. How we respond to suffering illustrates this perfectly. Two people can go through the very same difficulties in life, and yet they will often react in very different ways. For one, may well be described as a living hell, and yet for the other, they may well claim that they've had a taste of heaven as they walked through their troubles, came through the other side. Suffering can cause division within ourselves and others, either through self-pity or embarrassment, or through the sense that life is treating us unfairly, that fate is somehow singling us out. That said, the very same experience of suffering can also unite us through a deeper shared sense of compassion and empathy. Suffering can lead us to feel as though we have been cast into hell, and yet through we can also get a taste of heaven. Or as Forest Church once put it, at times of trouble alone we are often lost, but by reaching out to and for others we entertain the possibility of redemption. You see, in our suffering we can build up walls of self-protection uh, and yet at the same time the same suffering can also foster compassion within us. We can react to the same thing so differently. And the fostering of compassion is, I believe, the purpose of religious community. By developing our compassion, we can create heaven in our own lifetimes. By not fleeing from suffering our own or that of others, we can show to one another that in times of trouble, we are not alone. We are not completely lost. By reaching out both to and for others, we get a taste of heaven. Karen Armstrong has said about religion and the religious life. She said that religion isn't about believing things. No, religion is ethical alchemy. It's about behaving in a way that changes you, that gives you intimations of holiness and sacredness. And personally for myself, these intimations of holiness and sacredness is what connection's all about. And heaven is a place where everything connects. So even in these times of physical separation, we can still be deeply, deeply connected. In fact, we can deepen those connections if we work on them. For we are all in this together. The barriers are coming down. Well, at least I hope so. I'd like to share with you now a wonderful meditation written by a wonderful, wonderful, now retired colleague, the Reverend Margaret Kirk. It is partly inspired by the poem Mending Wall by Robert Frost. Following the meditation, I will end with some final words of blessing. You know, we don't bless enough. We ought to bless more. And everyone can bless, they can bless with their loving presence. Why not try? Blessing. Blessing everything and everyone you come into contact with. I was going to say meet, but you won't meet them. That you come into contact with through whatever means. Bless them with your beautiful presence this day. Invite them in. Open up. Develop deeper connection. So I invite us to just still ourselves for some time of prayer and meditation. Let's be still together. Something there is that doesn't love a wall by the Reverend Margaret Kirk. We see barriers erected between people of different lands. We see sheets of steel and towers of concrete called protection. We see boundaries policed, watchmen, women and children running from hunger and persecution, looking for a gap in the wall. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. We see walls of fear, fear of the young, fear of the stranger, fear of sexuality that is different, 
fear of the educated, fear of the poor, fear of the Muslim, fear of the Jew, fear upon fear, endless and perpetuating. And we offer a silent prayer that solid walls of fear will crumble to dust. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. We hear the language of separation, the jingoistic chant, the racial slur, words of indifference and dismissal, words arranged for the purpose of exclusion, words that sting and taunt, words that lie. Let us find words that ring with love and truthfulness, that reach out through the emptiness of separation. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. We see the deluded barriers of the mind protecting self. We see relationships stripped of affection as one person become close to another. We see people trapped in misunderstanding, old hurts reignited, bricks placed higher on the wall, goodwill and trust suspended, and we ask for boundaries that are not impenetrable through which light can shine and distance be dissolved. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. And when we need these boundaries for our own well-being, let us know them for what they are. Use them wisely and kindly, recognising our own vulnerability and that of others so each of us can find the space for retreat and succour, find that peace that passes all understanding, and be renewed with strength and with love for the task of living life more joyfully in communion with all others. Amen. May the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us, now and always. And may the love of God be with us all, in all that we feel, in all that we think, in all that we say, in all that we do. Let's go in love, go in peace, let's deepen those connections. Amen.